I have sat in my office and, uh, and not physically been able to sit up underneath the weight of the burden of God. And I'm not being dramatic. I physically couldn't sit up. I felt like I was going to be crushed underneath the burden that God was sharing with me. Right? That's what he's describing. In great spiritual agony, there the Lord conquered my unbelief, and I surrendered myself to God for his service. I told him that all the responsibility as to issues and consequences must rest with him, that as his servant it was mine to obey, mine to follow, his to direct, to care for, to guide me, and those that might labor with me. Need I say that the peace at once flowed into my burdened heart? There and then I asked him for 24 fellow workers, two for each of the 11 inland provinces of China, which were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia. In writing the petition on the margin of the Bible I had with me, I returned home with a heart enjoying rest such as it had been a stranger for months, and with an assurance that the Lord would bless his own work and that I should share in the blessing. I read this this afternoon, and I immediately paused, and then I went over and I sat in a, in a chair in Mike's office, and I closed my eyes and said, Lord, how do you want me to be praying for North America? North America is my mission field. It's the burden that God has shared with me. It's his burden. He shared it with me. He loves this continent. And he's going to do a crazy, awesome work on this continent in your generation. And he shared that with me. And so I said, Lord, how do you want me to be praying for North America? And he's, and he's giving me, piece by piece, he's giving me how he wants me to be laboring in prayer for the work of God in North America. I love the school of Christ. There is nothing like the school of Christ. So the Lord brings about his specific purposes. We see him leading Peter in this passage, right, according to his purposes. Has anybody ever read about the conversion of Hudson Taylor? It's an amazing story, really. Hudson Taylor was either 15 or 17, I don't remember, but he was a teenager, and he, he had yet to accept Christ. He had a very God-fearing mom. She was away on a journey. Um, in those days, it was a long ways. It was, it was like 80 miles away, and um, in the way they traveled, of course, that was a really long ways. And this incredible burden from the Lord came on her. Right? Now, years ago, I had no idea what that was. I now, in the school of Christ, I now actually know exactly what that is. When an incredible burden of God comes on you, and you feel like, if I don't pray, I would die. And you just flee. You just run to a place, a prayer closet, the closest one that you can find, so that you can pour your heart out before God. Well, Hudson Taylor's mother describes this, right? And she said, this incredible burden came on her when she was away on this journey. And so she, she, as soon as she could, she got into her room, she shut and locked the door, she got down on her knees before God, this is another thing the Lord has taught me about, which I can utterly delight in, and she determined before God that I'm going to pray until I get an answer. Now, please let me say this, and please everybody hear me. If this is driven by you, it will come to nothing. You can't treat God like a heavenly ATM. And so if this is driven by you or by your will, it's nothing. But when this is the leading of the Spirit of God, it's, it's everything. So history shows that Hudson Taylor's mom was being led by the Spirit of God. She goes into her room, she gets down on her knees, and she says, I am going to stay in this room, and I am going to labor in prayer for the soul of my son until the Lord gives me an answer. And she prays earnestly, right? Um, it's called travail, if you want the word, right? It's travailing in prayer. It's what Hannah did in Samuel. She travailed in prayer. She earnestly prayed. In James, the book of James in the New Testament, it says Elijah prayed in his praying, right? He earnestly prayed. That's travail. So Hudson Taylor's mom, um, she, she labors for the soul of her son, Hudson Taylor. And eventually, in prayer, the Lord said, to Hudson Taylor's mom, just like what we're reading about in the book of Acts, he said to Hudson Taylor's mom, it is done. And so she thanked God. She accepted that, that it was that the work was done, and she got up. Now, she didn't know this. 80 miles away, Hudson Taylor had been wandering around the family home. Um, he picked up a gospel tract, and he started to read it. One particular verse stood out to him, and so he went to his bedroom, and he was pouring over the gospel tract, 
as his mother was led by the Spirit of God to labor in prayer 80 miles away. He accepted the Lord that day as his Savior. And so a number, a number of days later, when his mother arrived home from her journey, young Hudson Taylor comes bounding out of the house, and he says, Mother, Mother, and you know what she says? She said, I know son. I know. Isn't that awesome? You know what? Spoke to him from the bush. 
It's exactly the same as this, in this context in Acts chapter 13. They were praying, they were ministering to the Lord, they were fasting. And in that context, the Spirit of God spoke to them and said, You need to release to me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have called them to. When you resist the Holy Spirit of God and when you when you when you don't go into that prayer closet to sit and to worship, to sit and to adore, to sit and to get to know, to sit and to, and to supplicate, to pray. When you resist that, you rob yourself of the opportunities that God is looking for to guide you into his blessing. Does this make sense? It's in that context, biblically, that the Lord, that the Lord speaks. Um, when was it? A year and a half ago, a year and a couple months ago. I, I woke up, my family was on the East Coast for a singing competition. I was in the house by myself. I know this doesn't sound romantic at all, and it's not what you're supposed to say, but I was actually looking forward to the week by myself. Um, and it's not because I don't absolutely adore my family, because I do. I do absolutely adore them. Um, but you know what I love more? I had an entire week, right? I would get up in the morning, I would make my coffee. At that point, I was sicker than I am now. Um, I would make my coffee. I would sit for four or five hours on the couch with the Lord uh, in the morning, just uninterrupted time with the Lord. On this particular morning, I got up and um, I looked at our bank account. I don't even, I hardly ever do that. I don't even know why I did. But I looked at our bank account and it had something like $39 or $45, I don't remember, but somewhere around that. And it shocked me how little money was was in our bank account. And so I texted Lynn, my wife, and I said, um, how much money are we supposed to have in our bank account? And she said, well, I don't remember the exact number, but, but um, we had a good buffer. That's what she said. She said, I know we have a good buffer, which, by the way, doesn't mean $40. <laughs> and, and so I thought, something's wrong. So I went into Lynn's office, and I found the ledger. She keeps track of the books. She pays the bills. She does all of that for our family. So I found her ledger. I opened it up. I took a picture of the, the current page, and I texted it to my wife. When she had a chance, she compared um, the ledger with online banking, and she called me back, and she said, sweetheart, I am so sorry. Uh, she said, I made a clerical error for $1,190. So she thought, you know, like, that's her definition of a good buffer, right? Um, and, and, um, but we were all the way down to almost zero. She had made a mistake for $1,190. And I immediately said, oh, don't worry about it. This is how the Lord glorifies his name, right? These are the, the stories. Like, this is just a story waiting to happen. And so we committed it to the Lord and trusted him. Really, it was about that simple. I just went on with my day. So later that day, I was praying with Mike Atwood. I was seated on that same couch, and um, I was praying over FaceTime with Mike. Um, I prayed first, and it was just normal. By the way, that's what most prayer is. Like a lot of the stories you hear are the more are the lessons that God teaches, right? Or the more the more extreme things that God has done. Most prayer is just prayer, right? It's just laboring in prayer. And so I prayed first, and it was just normal. It was just laboring in prayer over an adulterous bride, over 530, it's actually more than that, 530 million souls in North America that desperately need to hear about Jesus Christ in this generation. These are the things that we were praying about. So I prayed, I said amen, just, just normal, right? Mike begins to pray, and in this prayer meeting, this incredible burden from the Lord just came on me. And it's like the flipping of a light switch. All of a sudden, just boom, right? You feel this incredible burden. I was doing my best to be quiet as Mike prayed, and I was just weeping. And um, and it was almost like I could almost just couldn't be quiet, just weeping as Mike was just laboring in prayer for souls, laboring in prayer that the Lord would revive the church. Um, it was so intense that I thought when Mike said amen, um, for several minutes, I thought, when Mike says amen, I'm going to have to just say, Mike, I got to go, and then just shut my computer. Um, but as Mike was wrapping up his prayer, um, as quickly and as powerfully as, this, as the burden came on, it just left. And so all of a sudden, there I am, and all of a sudden, it's just like this again. And so Mike wraps up his prayer. And um, I talked to him for about 25 or 30 seconds, said goodbye, shut my computer, 
And then I said to the Lord, Lord, if you want me to sit here and pray all day, that's what I want to do. Right? And I'm not talking about spiritual discipline. Like, we crossed that bridge a long time ago. Right? There was a time where prayer was a spiritual discipline. Now it's the greatest joy that I've ever experienced in all of my life. And so I said, Lord, if you want me to sit here all day, that's what I want to do. If you want me to sit here and pray through, that's the way the old timers would speak of it, right? You pray through to God. If, if you want me to sit here and pray through to you, that's what I want to do. And you know what the Lord said? This is one of the first times in my life I started to experience this. The Lord said, Scott, I'm using you guys. Trust my timing. Trust my way. Now, this is me to a fault. You know what I said? Lord, if you want me to sit here and pray all day, that's what I'll do. That's what I want to do, right? That's me to a fault, right? Always wanting to run ahead of the Lord. The Lord has trained me not to do that, and yet I know that that's my propensity. That's my tendency. And so I said again, one more time, Lord, I will sit here all day and pray if that's what you want me to do. And he just said again, he said, Scott, trust my timing, trust my way. And then he said this, and I, this is one of the first times in my life. By the way, leading up to this, I have been begging the Lord to teach me the things that I'm sharing with you from God's Word. I've been telling him, Lord, I don't have the ability to be personally led by the Spirit of God. I don't have the maturity. I don't have the sensitivity. I don't know what the difference between my thoughts and your guidance. You have to meet me where I am. You have to lead me on, right? And so here I am. Um, I said that twice to the Lord, and then the Lord said this, right? I told you. Trust me, trust my way. And then he said this. He said, now, Scott, get up, go to your mailbox, and get your provision from me. And I said out loud, I said, you want me to get up, walk to my mailbox, and get my provision from you? And he said this, word for word, he said, go get your daily bread. And so I stood up, honestly, I was like a timid little child. I, I stood up, and I'm like, like this is my little leap of faith, right? And so I walked to the I walked to the door. It's all of like 12 feet. Um, the mailbox is right outside the door, right? I walked to the door. Long story short, that day in check form, the Lord provided $1,180 to meet to meet our need. I was so excited. I called my wife. I prayed and thanked the Lord. I asked the Lord, "Can I share this with your people?" It's on our blog. If you want it, if you want it, it's like a five-minute video. If you want to see it, it's right there. And so I sat on my patio and I made this little video, just telling the story for the Lord's glory. Um, a girl that lives about a half, a young, a, a woman that lives about a half an hour from us. Um, she wrote me when she saw the video and she said, I had to tell you this. The Lord didn't provide $1,180. He provided $1,190. She said, I felt so silly when I did it. But earlier this week, um, when I wrote your wife a note, I, I just felt compelled by the Lord to put a $10 bill in. And so when I got her note on Facebook Messenger, I walked into my wife's office and right in the middle of my wife's desk was her note and a $10 bill, you know, just right there. Now, do I think God's provision is cool? Sure I do. But honestly, that is, that's one, one millionth of the coolness in the story. You know what, what, is the, what is the utterly cool thing? The Lord was teaching me to listen to his voice, right? He was teaching me to be personally guided by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm never going to get over the fact that God provides for, for our family. I'm never going to get over that. That is an utter delight, right? But the fact that the Spirit of God will speak to me, will guide me in this life, it just blows my, it blows my little mind. Um, the personal guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, Acts 16. Yeah. Acts 16, verse number 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Holy or the Spirit did not permit them. And I'm just going to stop there. So if you're taking notes, the Spirit of God will direct in redirection. 
This is Paul after Acts 13. He had already been sent out <coughs> to serve God. He's busy serving God, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of God, it doesn't say that he sent four she-bearers to guard the road, right? It doesn't say that, that the war broke out in that region, and so we just reasoned with one another that I'm not going there, right? I'm going this way. And so they went through the gospel. If you understand the history, they took the gospel to Europe as a result of the Holy Spirit preventing them, right? And so all I want you to notice is that the Holy Spirit can and does and will, if you have ears to hear it, redirect you in life. He'll say, no, not that way. And then he'll say, this is the way that I want you to go. By the way, this is exactly what happened in my wife and my life. I've been all over North America um, serving the Lord. I've actually been over a fair bit of four continents serving the Lord. And then two and a half years ago, I got sick. Now, I know that's slightly different than the Spirit of God saying it, right? But by the way, I might as well say this. One thing the Lord will use to guide you is circumstances, right? Right? Like if I said, I really think God wants me to be a rap star, right? I really think that. You know, uh, but nobody ever asks me to come to concerts, right? And so that, right, the Lord will use circumstances to guide you, open and shut doors, right? So, so two years ago, two and a half years ago, I, I was traveling everywhere preaching the word of God, and then I get sick, right? And by the way, at the beginning, I was really sick. That's called acute sickness. And then little by little, I trans, transferred into, what's the other word? Chronic. Yeah, thanks. Chronic sickness. Um, anyways, and then learning to sit at the Lord's feet, learning to discern the inner witness of the Holy Spirit of God, eventually he said to my family, I'm going to take you to California. Uh, maybe the Lord will give us more time to talk about that um, this week. But all I want you to notice is that the Holy Spirit will work in redirection. Okay, um, one more, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse number 22. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the, the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. If you're taking notes, just jot down the warning. If you have ears to hear it, if you have maturity to discern it, the Holy Spirit of God will warn you. Just let me give you just one tiny example. The first time I went to Kenya, years and years ago, I got really sick. Um, like, really, really sick. I was in a Kenyan hospital. Um, a friend of mine was reading scripture over me. Uh, they were very worried about me. I was really, I was really <laughs> sick. Now, there's actually a ton of awesome details that I'm going to leave out for a sake of time. Um, but... It was daytime in Kenya. It was the middle of the night in Topeka, Kansas, where my wife was. Um, she woke up in the middle of the night, and she knew, just like this, she knew that the Lord, the Lord wanted her to get up and wanted to, her to labor in prayer for me in Kenya. So I'm lying, um, I think, probably, I try never to exaggerate, but honestly, probably, deathly sick in a Kenyan hospital. And the Lord wakes my wife up in Topeka, Kansas, in the middle of the night, and says, pray for your husband. And so she got up out of bed. By the way, choose your spouse carefully. Um, she got up out of bed. I mean, what a gift, right? She got up out of bed. She got down on her knees beside the bed. And she labored in prayer that night until the Lord assured her that everything everything was okay. And then she just thanked the Lord, and she crawled, crawled back in the bed. You know what happened to me in Kenya? It's the first time in my life I ever remember this happening. When the pain got so intense, I think my brain was swelling. Um, when the pain got so intense, right, all of a sudden, just in an instant, I just felt the, God, the presence of God closer than I had ever felt before in my life. And I actually felt the Lord physically touch me. And, and I wasn't instantly um, healed, but I just, I, instantly the pain in my head went away. And then I just, I just, instead of just going downhill, which I was, the pain in my head was gone, um, and I just started getting better. And within about a day, I was I was better. Now, how can you possibly explain that? The word warned, specifically, the Spirit of God that lives inside of my wife, warned her that something was wrong. There was danger, right? Okay, enough about that. These are all different examples 
of, of the book of Acts, of the personal guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. I want to give you, um, with the time that we have left, I want to give you one more point. And this is, this is really important, especially for those of you that are biblical thinkers. Point number three, a pattern to follow. Point number three, a pattern to follow. As you mature, as you study God's Word, I hope that this isn't new to many of you, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's new to most of you, um, you will find that a good pattern to look for in the Word of God, if you're looking for what should we personally follow, a good pattern to look for is, is if it's promised in the Gospels, if it's practiced in the book of Acts, and if it's taught in the epistles. Is it promised in the Gospels, practiced in the book of Acts, taught in the epistles? That is a biblical pattern, right? A good biblical pattern to follow. And I just want to show you with the time that we have this, that this, what I'm, what I'm describing to you, the personal leading of the Holy Spirit of God, is promised in the Gospels, it is practiced in Acts, and it is taught doctrinally in the epistles, in God's Word. Which, when I saw this, by the way, many, many, I'm just going to be frank with you. Many times along this road, I've kind of thought, am I crazy? Right? Like, things would happen in my life, and I would tell my wife, or I would just keep it to myself. But there have been numerous times that I thought, like, this is so new to me, right? I didn't grow up this way, by the way. I just discovered these things. Years ago, I told the Lord, I want you. I want everything that you want for me. I want nothing that you don't want for me. I don't care what it costs me. I want to follow Christ. And this is the journey that the Lord has brought me on. So there have been plenty of times that I've thought, yikes, right? And so when I finally studied this, and when I finally saw what I'm about to give you, I just thought, yes, there it is in the Word of God. It's right there, plain as day. Okay, John chapter 16. Go ahead and turn. I want you to see it. These things are important. John chapter 16. This is where it's promised in the Gospels. And I'm just going to read you one tiny little phrase, really. I mean, we would give me a joy to dig more in. But John chapter 16 and verse number 13. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you. And I'm just going to stop there. Now, there's an immediate context, there's a broader context, it would be so fun. This is an amazing passage of Scripture, right? It would be so fun to dig into that, but that's all I want you to see. Jesus Christ is talking about the Holy Spirit, and he says, he will guide you. Okay, for sake of time. Um, we already looked through the book of Acts. So if you're taking notes, that's where it's promised in the Gospels. All of point number two is where it is practiced in Acts. And then let's go to where it is taught in the epistles. Go to Romans chapter 8, if you would. Romans chapter 8. According to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So if you're taking notes, jot down walk according to the spirit, or walk in the spirit. Now look at verse number 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So write down walk and then write down led. So the point I'm making is so simple. It is promised in the Gospels, it is practiced in the book of Acts, it is doctrinally taught in the epistles. The leadership of the Spirit of God. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? Another way of describing true believers is to say they are led by the Spirit of God. Paul is not referring to spectacular instances of divine guidance in the lives of eminent Christians. This is so important. Rather, he is speaking of what is true of all sons of God, namely, that they are led by the Spirit. 
Now the point that I'm the point that I'm trying to earnestly make here, I know you're tired, stick with me for just a couple more minutes and we'll be done. The point that I'm trying to make here is what I'm describing biblically is for a carefree Christian. It's not for like really committed Christians. It's for every Christian. The only way that you will not end up being led by the Spirit of God in your life is if you resist, grieve, and quench. That's the only way. Because there's only two options. Either you're going to quench him, resist him, grieve him, or you're going to be led by him. He's already trying to lead you. Is that good news? That's his job. He's going to lead you to Christ. How many of you want a deeper relationship with Christ? Yeah, right? Some of you came to me today saying, I want more, right? I can't grow fast enough. I want deeper. I don't know what to do. This is incredibly good news. He is already trying to lead you on. All you have to do is submit, right? Rest. Now, there again, like Phi did such a beautiful job of laying out. There is an active part of it too. Obedience, being in the Word of God, deciding to go into your prayer closet, you know, things like that. Okay, right now in Galatians 5, 16 and 18. I'm not going to turn there for sake of time, but it shows the exact same thing. A different epistle, but it says to, to, be, to walk in the Spirit and to be led by the Spirit. It would be making the same point, so I just want to give it to you, give it to you for your notes. So, what have we said? Uh, the example of Jesus Christ, he was baptized by the Spirit, he was filled with the Spirit, he was led by the Spirit. He was empowered by the Spirit. And then we looked into the book of Acts. They followed the example of Christ. And then the Apostle Paul, on behalf of Christ, doctrinally taught that Christians in a continual way should be walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit. As, like, as in any topic, um, please come and, ask, come and ask questions. The things that I'm giving you, I'm 42 years old, right? I know I look remarkably younger than that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm 42 years old. Uh, the things that I'm giving to you, this is what the Lord is teaching me right now. Um, we pray for you all the time that you will go further than we ever went. You know how that happens? You learn these things now, right? Did you hear Sunday's prayer last night? Who heard Sunday's prayer last night? Do you remember? How do you go further than my generation? Right? How do you go further than Sonny's generation? You learn these things now, right? Learn to love your prayer closet now. Learn to make Christ preeminent in your life now, not service. Christ, right? Submit to him now. Allow the leadership of the Holy Spirit now. And he will take you further than I will ever be capable of going because I am learning these lessons as a 42-year-old. Make sense? Okay. Father, we commit it to you. Uh, please, Lord God, be with my young brothers and sisters. Be with all of us. Lord, I love the school of prayer. We want to learn. We want to grow. We want to press on with you. We commit this to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.